Hello and welcome to Global News Today, bringing you exclusive insights and fresh perspectives from leading experts and influential decision makers every single weekday here on Al Arabiya News. I'm Tom burgess Watson. coming up on today's program. Israel denies it is stopping humanitarian aid to Gaza, as Israel's military says 50 trucks carrying supplies from the World Food Programme entered northern Gaza through the Erez crossing. Well, this comes as the US gives Israel 30 days to boost humanitarian access to Gaza or risk having some US military assistance cut off. Israel resumes airstrikes on Beirut just hours after the US voiced its concerns over the scale of attacks on the Lebanese capital. Welcome, great to have you with us. We're going to begin in Gaza, where Israel has denied it is stopping humanitarian aid to the war-torn region and instead says it is targeting Hamas in the north. Well, this comes as Israel's military body, COGAT, that is the Coordination of Government Activities in the Territories, announced that 30 aid trucks from the World Food Programme had entered Gaza through the Erez crossing, marking the end of a two-week hiatus during which no food aid was delivered to the north. Well, yesterday, the US gave Israel 30 days to boost humanitarian aid access, access in Gaza or risk having some US military assistance cut off. Well, earlier, the Gaza Health Ministry said that at least 65 people had been killed during the course of the last 24 hours. Earlier today, the Israeli military claimed that it successfully eliminated a Hamas commander in the northern Gaza Strip and killed more than 50 what it called terrorists in the Jabalia area of Gaza in close quarters encounters and aerial strikes. Well, for more on all of this, I'm joined by retired colonel of the Israeli Military Intelligence and senior fellow at the Institute for Counterterrorism at Rachman University, Miri Eisen. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Al Arabiya News. Um, it's being reported that Israel faces a shortage of interceptor missiles. Um, and these are, of course, crucial uh, for your air defenses and the protective shield. Um, just tell us what, just how serious this shortage is uh, and how it's being addressed. The IDF has not said there's been a shortage. That's something that has come out from a lot of other places. The Israeli Defense Forces and within that, the air defenses, which is part of the Air Force, had an enormous amount of time both to prepare for all of the different scenarios. Right now, Israel is intercepting rockets and missiles, um, still from Hamas in the Gaza Strip, from Hezbollah in Lebanon, from Hezbollah in Iraq, and from directly from Iran. So obviously, we've used a lot of our interceptors, but this is something that is done both in Israel and around the world. I don't think that we're at the stage that we feel we can't intercept. We are aware that we need to replenish um, as much as we can. Who knows what's up the road? Sure. And I mean, there's all these different uh, uh, mechanisms for intercepting uh, and how Israel defends itself. There's the Iron Dome, which I gather is for short range drones and missiles. There's David Sling, uh, which is for intercepting heavier rockets. The Arrow system, which blocks ballistic missiles. And then uh, the US says it's going to be deploying uh, the THAAD uh, defense uh, battery. Just tell us what that will add to the level of protection that Israel will, will have. What we're looking at right now is the possibility, the threat, that the Islamic uh, revolutionary regime in Iran, the capabilities that are made in the Iranian industries, in their own military industries, a lot of it is what I call reverse engineering, both from North Korean missiles. Nowadays, they all have a lot of connections, both with Russia and with North Korea. And when Israel wants to stop to defend, to intercept those incoming missiles. And that's, as you said, the short range, the mid range, and the long range. You have missiles today that are literally intercontinental ballistic missiles that Iran has developed over the years. They have a space industry. This is something that they're very proud of. They have put satellites into the into the sky. And that, that capability is one that the United States has been at the forefront of their capabilities to intercept literally something that's going into space and back from space. Um, it's the combination of one layer on top of the other. And I do it with my hands as one on top of the other, 
all of them. Give protection to all of the people underneath. Let's be clear, none of them are 100%. Meaning with any type of system like this, you always have a percentage that may get through these protection systems. And with regards to a, a potential attack by Iran, uh, in terms of the timing, it's unlikely to come before Israel's uh, counterattack on Iran for uh, the last Iranian attack, which was three weeks ago. Um, is that attack going to happen sometime soon, do you think? Uh, and, and what form are you expecting it to take? When we look at it from Israel, and I think that inside the Middle East, we look at it a little bit differently than the rest of the world. This isn't tit for tat. The Islamic regime of Iran, through the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and a lot of their other arms, are the destabilizing, arming endless munitions, endless arsenals throughout the Middle East. The Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah in Iraq, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and they themselves have fired directly against Israel in that missile attack, both in April and now again in October. So it isn't that suddenly there's something that starts and it's tit for tat. When we look at the Iranian capabilities that they've built up in their own industries over the years, they have every range of missiles and UAVs, drones, that you can think of. Short range, mid range, long range. At the end, Iran is over a thousand kilometers, almost really over a thousand miles distance from Israel, which means that they have to have long range missiles that are mainly a different type of rocket that has a guidance system. Um, and for those, we are looking at the capabilities to intercept. Most of the types they have take, just because of the time it takes, 10 to 12 minutes to reach Israel. That gives you time to detect them, to intercept them in the air, to give early warning for people to go into shelters, to try to be as protective as possible. Um, in the last two times, they fired two to 300, more or less at the same time, different types of projectiles. I would say that they have the capability to fire hundreds of rockets and missiles at the same time. And at the end, it's about the distance until they arrive here. I really would like to see this not happening. Israel did not choose a war, does not want a war, not a war with Iran, not a war with Hezbollah or Hamas. Um, having said that, I hope that we are ready for it, both with the defense systems, but also by preemptive um, actions. Yeah, Israel's uh, defenses were severely tested on Sunday when Hezbollah uh, killed four soldiers in, in Binyamina. And um, one of your colleagues uh, said in response to that, I'm talking about Asaf Orion, who's a former Israeli brigadier general. Uh, he said, we're not seeing Hezbollah's full capability yet. I just wonder what you think he means by that and what sort of capability uh, he is implying we might see in the future from Hezbollah. So, Tom, I'm a person of words. So first I'm going to come and say we weren't severely tested on Sunday. I say it sadly. This is called statistics. We intercept 90 to 95 percent. And what we saw on Sunday was the one that got through. We'll learn the lesson from that one. But that doesn't change the equation. That's not a game changer. It's a horrific tragedy in its own way. But just like you can have a terror attack, even though you prevent 98 percent, the percent that gets through is an entire world. And I say that because I absolutely agree with uh, a an old colleague and friend, I agree with him on this sense that Hezbollah has enormous capabilities. A small amount of them Hezbollah made on their own, mainly an industry that was established again by the Islamic regime of Iran in Lebanon and in Syria. But Hezbollah also has all of the cutting edge weapons that Iran was willing to give them. There was an open line of supply from Iran through Iraq, through Syria to get to Hezbollah in Lebanon. And I too do not see Hezbollah using the full extent of what I expected them to use. But here I'm going to put two caveats. Maybe they're not using them because we are preemptively attacking and destroying, degrading portions of it, not all of it. So they can't use it. And maybe they're not using them because they are holding back. And if they're holding back Hezbollah, it's only because the Islamic regime of Iran is the one that would tell them hold back because Iran built this whole system so that nobody would ever attack Iran. They are the destabilizer and that's part of the Iranian defense system. So both options are there. It could be both at the same time. They don't have enough capabilities and they want to hold back what they have. I would have expected to see swarms of drones, similar to what we've seen unhappily in the Russia-Ukraine war. We have not seen swarms here. 
We've seen singular ones. I expected to see 100, 200, 300, even 1,000 different types of projectiles fired within an hour because that would overwhelm. It wouldn't stop our systems. It would just statistically make them less effective. And they haven't done so. And I do think that it's because they don't have that we've degraded the capability and that they're holding back portions for that last day when Iran gets attacked. Yeah, you mentioned the Iranian weapons, but it's reported that uh, Hezbollah has also got some Russian and Chinese uh, weaponry, in particular anti-tank missiles. Um, do you think that's likely? Do you think they actually do have those weapons? The Israeli Defense Forces in the last three weeks have been acting in a kilometer area adjacent to the Israeli-Lebanese border on the Lebanese side. Tom, there is enormous footage that for some reason everybody's ignoring right now that has been put out from the tunnels, subterranean tunnels, just like you have in the Gaza Strip, only in the Lebanese terrain, where you have in these tunnels ATGMs, MLRSs, different types of RPGs and absolutely have written on them, both in Russian and in Chinese, um, all of the above. It is an enormous cachet of weapons. You know, it's not, hi, I just found 50 RPGs. You're finding an amount which is literally a terror army that has capabilities that very few standing militaries in the world have. Hezbollah, mainly in the Radwan force, had deployed in these underground caches um, directly next to the border. So there's footage of it. You can bring it up and see with the letters, both in Chinese and in Russian. And there's an argument, isn't there, that Russia's got a vested interest here. Uh, in, in, they want the warfare uh, to continue because it will exhaust uh, U.S. stocks of interceptor missiles, which we talked about at the beginning, um, because at the moment the United States is providing some of them. Uh, they're also giving some to uh, the Ukrainians, and they'll uh, they'll reach a point, won't they, given uh, supply and demand, that they'll have to choose between Israel and Ukraine. Russia, as we speak right now, is using Russian airplanes to bomb in northern Syria against some of the areas where you have its jihadists, but it's other types of anti-Bashar um, Assad forces. So Russia is involved not just in supplying weapons, it is using Russian airplanes with Russian um, pilots right now to bomb physically inside northern Syria near the Turkish border. Russia buys from that Islamic regime of Iran that I talk about so extensively. They buy drones, UAVs. So we're talking about what is, to a certain degree, I don't want to call it a new alliance, but at the end of the day, is it just economic? Is it also ideological? Absolutely, Russia has a vested interest. They have an interest both in their forces on the ground physically that have been in Syria for many, many years since the Soviet Union times, but also in the fact that their weaponry is the one that's used by a lot of the different countries in this area. So they're trying things out there on the ground. The only thing that maybe surprises me is that Israel still has diplomatic ties with Russia. But that's just about me, you know, geopolitics in that sense, the fact that we have diplomatic ties both with Russia and with China, considering how they are right now participating by supplying weapons, by buying oil, by the drones, etc. It's quite surprising. Um, we're hearing from uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, he's ruling out any talk of a ceasefire that was sort of floated by uh, Hezbollah in the last 24 hours. I just want to ask you, what's your understanding of uh, how Israel is doing in terms of achieving its objectives on the ground in Lebanon? In the military sense, what the actions of the IDF have been over the last three weeks is by physically, not just clearing out, they're not burning down bushes, but they're going into both that subterranean underground arena that's being exposed into the towns and villages that are right next to the border, and they are destroying, degrading the Radwan force, that's the elite Hezbollah force that was going to do an October 7th attack. And when people ask me, what does that mean? They were planning to do an October 7th attack. In the years before the October 7th attack, one of the reasons, not the only one, that Israel was so blindsided and did not see what was happening with Hamas was because we were looking at the Radwan forces at Hezbollah and what they were preparing. So when you ask, what is Israel doing? Where are we going? First and foremost, we're denying the Radwan force in Hezbollah 
from doing an October 7th attack. They wanted to do it in the last few weeks. They want to attack. They had a full plan that was called Operation Liberation of Galilee. You can go bring up footage of Hassan Nasrallah presenting it with a map of all of the Radwan forces showing themselves do so. For somebody to be able to come back and live in their town, village, kibbutz, city, which is adjacent to the Israeli-Lebanese border, a kilometer from the border, five kilometers from the border, you have to be able to believe that Hezbollah cannot do an October 7th attack. We already saw that kind of attack. And that's what the military forces are doing. In addition, they are attacking mainly from the air. The cachet of weapons that Hezbollah, again, this enormous amount of weapons that came into South Lebanon over the last 15 years, at the time that UNIFIL was deployed there as a force, and what UNIFIL was supposed to do was to prevent it coming there. And it did not do so. We are exposing enormous cachet of weapons. So Israel is destroying the cachet of weapons, trying as much as possible to make sure that when people come back home, they will believe, like I need to believe, that they are secure enough that there cannot be an October 7th attack. It doesn't stop every rocket. It doesn't stop every drone. But the, the, the action of October 7th, of that one day of coming in thousands, of destroying, pillaging, all of the different horrific actions that happened down south, that needs to be preemptively denied. Uh, Colonel Eisen, tell us a little bit about the terrain in the border area, because we've been talking quite a lot about the, the tunnels, we've been talking about uh, what it's like there on the border. And, and for people who don't know, I mean, people who've never seen it, I mean, are there border walls and fences? I gather there are, and I'm just wondering how easily uh, they can be breached. I'd also like to know whether there's anything that makes this terrain particularly hostile and particularly difficult for armies to operate in. So I think a lot of people, especially when they're thinking of the Middle East, both of Israel, but of all of the countries that are around us, and this is on El Arabiya, um, but from outside the arena, they have a tendency to think of the Middle East as being sand. Um, and in that sense, and flat. And the Gaza Strip is quite sandy and very flat, and it fulfills people's expectations. Lebanon is a beautiful mountainous country. It is very mountainous, mountainous alp mountainous, um, you know, mountainous, think now of high mountains, snow in the winter. It has lots of forests, it has lots of boulders. So it has steep terrain. And this definitely impacts and has impacted inside Lebanon all the years. One of the things that you've always seen is that Lebanon was a place where persecuted people would go to because it's far away and you can be very disconnected. And I say that because that's part of the challenges that certainly the IDF face right now. Um, having said that, that's you don't stop because of that. You build your capabilities to try to get past that. It means you have to know what you can do with infantry, what you can do with vehicles, what you need to do with helicopters coming in. And you have to know that Hezbollah has anti-aircraft missiles and that for them, they would love to bring down an Israeli plane, helicopter, etc. That would be for them an enormous success. So you have to look at all of these different capabilities. You take it slowly, systematically and carefully. And that's what the Israeli troops on the ground have been doing in the last three weeks. I happen to be very old. And in the first Lebanon war, I was a young officer in 1982. And the biggest challenge that Israel had then, and then Israel invaded, and I'm using that term, to go against Palestinian terror organizations that were based inside southern Lebanon at the time and attacking into Israel. And the terrain was the thing that People do not understand how much it impacts you, what you can do with a Jeep, what you can do with a tank, what you can do with a motorcycle, and what you can do with a pickup truck. And that's really something you have to take into account. Okay, well, I'm being told we're out of time. There was lots more I would love to have uh, had time to discuss with you, but we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Colonel Miri Eisen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, and happy holidays. Chag Sukkot Sameach. Well, for more on this, uh, we're joined now by the former UN Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights uh, and also Executive Director of the Burkhoff Foundation in Berlin. Um, Andrew Gilmore, thank you very much indeed for being with us here on Al Arabiya News. Great to have you with us. Um, I'd like to start by asking for your take on that ultimatum that the United States has issued to Israel. Uh, they've said to Israel, you've got 30 days to boost humanitarian aid flows into uh, Gaza or risk U.S. military assistance. And I just want to ask you, first of all, uh, what you read into uh, this message and why it's been given. And second of all, what sort of a difference it would make to Israel uh, were Washington to come good on that threat? 
I read into that message that the Americans are absolutely privately appalled by the devastating human rights abuses and casualties inflicted by the Israeli bombardment and by the humanitarian disaster. As to your second question, what, what it would have, what impact it would have, it would have an absolutely devastating effect on Israel if they believed it. And I suspect they don't because there's nothing that they have done or think that, or they think that they can do that would lead to such an outcome. They, they simply do not believe that the Americans will actually blow the red whistle on them and say this is absolutely unacceptable because if they've killed this many civilians over the past year and uh, seem to be planning to kill a great many more in the next month, and, and, and I noted that they've been given another 30 days sort of grace period to do it, I don't really see what impact, what incentive they would have to change their tactics. I don't think they believe the Americans will do that. And in any case, the Israelis will be thinking of the American elections, which, which the results will be known by then, so that they will factor that into their calculations too. It's, it's quite late in the day, isn't it, as a threat, um, given that we're more than a year into the horrific uh, humanitarian situation in Gaza and now an unfolding humanitarian disaster in Lebanon as well. Um, are you surprised that America hasn't said more and sooner uh, than what it put out, uh, I think it was on Sunday, when that letter was sent to Israel? Yes. I mean, had it been the Trump administration in power, I, I don't suppose I would have been surprised. But I am surprised that the Biden administration, or rather, I was surprised, but over the past year, I've stopped being surprised. There seems to be literally no limit that can cross their threshold. Yeah, I was going to ask you later in the program, but now seems like a, a, an apt moment to ask you this question, because, of course, there are just two and a half months left of the Biden administration. Um, and I'm just wondering what its legacy will be with regards to uh, events in the Middle East. I, I wish the Biden administration no ill will, I have no ill will towards them. But in terms of the Middle East, well, what they have allowed, what they have not just allowed, but provided full-on diplomatic, political, moral, and above all, military support for in the last year is surely what they will be remembered for. And the fact that the casualty rate is so high, that the suffering is so high, that the deliberate targeting of journalists and UN workers in Gaza, and now major harassment of UN forces in southern Lebanon, and of course civilians in Lebanon as well, I, I don't see how they can be remembered for anything other than that, a series of, of vague sort of trying to pressure Israel in the gentlest possible way, in private, they say, but we, do, we don't know because nothing in public is, is really said about it, asking them to behave in a more restrained way, less lethal way. But um, I don't think they can be remembered for anything other than presiding over this humanitarian cataclysm, frankly. And diplomatic failures, because countless visits to the region by the US Secretary of State have yielded no results. There hasn't been a ceasefire in Gaza since November of last year. So clearly, um, very few success stories to their name uh, with regards to diplomacy. Very, very few indeed, absolutely. But it, I think we can explain that in the sense that they, they had no stick. They just pleaded with the Israelis, please don't kill quite so many children. And the Israelis say, why should we listen to you? Because what are you going to do if we don't? <laughs> so, um, and the Israeli leadership had that calculus all along that they could uh, get away with it. Just talking about the humanitarian situation in Gaza more specifically, earlier on this year, you said uh, in Gaza, we're probably seeing the highest kill rate of any military since the Rwandan genocide of 1994. Uh, two questions on that. Um, do you stand by that statement? And can we switch it from probably to definitely? And are you, uh, in comparing uh, the kill rate to the Rwandan genocide, prepared to describe and characterize what's happened in Gaza as having been a genocide? 
No, um, I, the, I, I said that, um, and interestingly, I, and I said probably because I wasn't sure um, that in that period, I think I said it in March, or possibly it's February, that in between October and February, no, and I, and I shouldn't have said military because actually the people who did the killing in Rwanda were not military, they were militias. But um, of course, in, in Gaza, it was very much a military. But nobody had killed that many civilians, in particular women and children, at such a high ratio. A number of people questioned that, but nobody, literally nobody, including people who wrote in angry letters to the uh, messages to the BBC, ever came up with a previous example in the last 30 years that indicated that there had been a higher kill ratio. So on that grounds, I still, I, I don't know for absolute certain that one can't find another example elsewhere in the world in the last 30 years, but I know that nobody has been able to present one to me in the last um, seven months since I said that. Let's talk about this um, so-called general's plan. The general's plan is a plan put together by a group of uh, retired Israeli generals, and their plan would be to starve out Hamas militants uh, from uh, northern Gaza by sealing off humanitarian aid. Um, obviously, hundreds of thousands of people's lives would be in danger, the lives of innocent civilians. Um, how seriously do you think that plan is being taken by uh, the Israeli prime minister? I, of course, I don't know how, how seriously, but I would have thought that the fact that, as you've just said, such tactics would lead to hundreds of thousands of people having to be moved yet again and going through famine situation and bombardment and everything else, leading to probably tens of thousands more casualties. From what we have seen, both of the Israeli generals and of the Israeli ship, I don't see why that, that would um, hold them back in the absence of sustained international pressure. pressure. Um, and as we discussed before, the Israelis don't feel that there is sustained international pressure for them to desist, to desist from such a, a policy. Such a policy would be illegal, though, wouldn't it, under international law? And it would set some very dangerous precedents for other countries to employ in the future. And it would be very difficult to then uh, hold them to account for having done so. Absolutely. And for... For those of us, including myself, for example, who also feel very strongly about um, very probable Russian war crimes in Ukraine, for example, it is very problematic because when we talk about these issues uh, in Ukraine, other people point out, well, hang on, why are you silent about Gaza, where actually there are probably worse war crimes being committed. So of course, it's a terrible precedent. And that is, for anybody who's been involved in the human rights movement globally, I mean, the great problem is when people take a selective approach. Because if you take the view that war crimes are only committed by my enemies and anybody I like can't commit war crimes because they're my friend um, and, and we won't call them out on it, then that just destroys the whole basis for, for discussing human rights and violations, serious, serious violations, which are known now. Serious violations of international humanitarian law is a long-winded way of saying war crimes. And uh, all of that effort to raise awareness and try to get people to be less willing to carry out such actions is weakened when there is a selective approach. Um, but of course, there's a lot more that, that would, that's been illegal. Um, and indeed, the UN Secretary General, and indeed, many other uh, leading international players, in, including the EU's um, Commissioner Borrell, uh, have been pretty outspoken about this, but it hasn't had much of an impact, as you as you can see. Yeah, and just you, wearing your, your former UN hat, I'd like to ask you about uh, the United Nations, because, of course, they seem to have run out of adjectives to describe uh, the situation in, in Gaza. Uh, the words totally unacceptable have become uh, rather hollow because they're so overused. Um, and I just want to ask you, I mean, it, clearly Israel has an issue with uh, UNRWA in Gaza, UNIFIL in Lebanon, these uh, UN institutions. Um, and the Israeli energy minister, Eli Cohen, has uh, described the UN as being uh, a failed organization. Uh, a failed organization. I just wonder whether you think, given that uh, the UN has not managed to prevent uh, the degree of bloodshed in Gaza, whether perhaps he's got a point. Well, sorry, those two issues you just mentioned don't cancel each other. Out because on the one hand, if it's weak, it's weak because the member states have not have not put 
their weight behind the UN. And this is a perennial issue. I worked for the UN for 30 years. Um, member states talk about UN values, but when it comes to actually supporting the UN, when the UN is in a difficult position, they don't do it. And my former colleagues in the United Nations, and I'm in close contact with many of them, are absolutely frustrated by the lack of support they get from the Europeans and the Americans, but the Europeans at least speak, generally speak more in terms about international law and trying to observe it and trying to stand up for the values of the UN Charter. And so when they don't do so and actually provide support, real support for the UN when they need it, then of course the UN can't be expected to do that. But, but it, 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 as you know very well, the, the reasons why the Israelis attack the UN isn't because they failed to stop the killings in Gaza, it's because they actually dare to criticize Israel for the way they handle these situations. So that, that I mean, they don't criticize it for being weak, they criticize it for being outspoken. So you're saying basically they find them uh, inconvenient and, and they get in the way of yeah. uh, them doing what they want to do in Lebanon, hence their desire for UNIFIL to disband and leave southern Lebanon, uh, and in Gaza with, in particular, uh, the sites being set on UNRWA. And uh, we've heard from Philippe Lazzarini, who heads up UNRWA, that Israel is, quote, bent on destroying UNRWA. Um, and of course, we gather that Israel would like to ban UNRWA from operating in Israeli territory, which would leave them unable to function. How would Gaza survive without UNRWA? Could it? I just correct you. Uh, um, it's not that they wouldn't allow UNRWA to operate on Israeli territory. They won't allow it to operate in Palestinian territory. And that is the, the crux, of course. They... Um, since UNIFIL and, and was set up in Lebanon in 1978, uh, 338 UN peacekeepers, blue helmets, have been killed. Now, the UN, we don't different, we don't have a column for who killed them. Sometimes it's not absolutely clear. But I can tell you a very large number of that 338 have been killed by the Israelis. And we also know that over 200 UN staff have been killed in Gaza in the last 12 months. Many of them targeted, many of them aren't just bombings, but they are precisely got in their homes, which, and of course, the address of every UN staff member is known by the Israelis. So there's definitely an inconvenience and there is a, and that's why no journalist is being allowed by Israel into Gaza. Of course, they don't want, it's an inconvenience if people see what's going on from that, that end. So both the UN and journalists are highly inconvenient. And I think that it also explains why quite so many journalists have also been killed in Gaza. Uh, and just to, just to wrap up, I mean, there is uh, this draft Israeli legislation that would ban uh, UNRWA from operating in Israeli territory. That's what uh, we gather. It's draft legislation. So that's what I was getting at in my, in my earlier question. Um, but we're going to leave it there. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us. Uh, Andrew Gilmore, thank you very much indeed. Well, for more on this, I'm joined now by the country director for the International Rescue Committee, the IRC, in the occupied Palestinian territories. Bart Witteveen, thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Al Arabiya News. Um, clearly, there's a horrific situation in Gaza, especially so in the north of the enclave. Could you just tell us what's your understanding of just how bad things have got there? Well, as we all know, uh, we're into the, uh, this escalation, this latest crisis in Gaza for well over a year now. And uh, the situation has fluctuated. It, has, it is quite extraordinary in terms of humanitarian crisis. And what we can say is uh, over the last uh, uh, four to six weeks, the situation in northern Gaza in particular has deteriorated significantly. Uh, in terms of military operations, in terms of uh, forced displacements, and most recently, uh, an almost complete closure uh, of the entry points into northern Gaza as of the 1st of October, uh, something that wasn't alleviated until uh, several days ago when the first uh, trucks were once again allowed in. So you can imagine this combination of very little supplies going in, uh, escalated military operations and, and, and forced movements of the civilian population. And the situation uh, has really become very complicated. 
Yeah, and today, unfortunately and very, very sadly, is the 16th of October, which is World Food Day. And clearly, uh, our thoughts mm. go out to people, you know, with, with nothing to eat there in northern Gaza, as you're saying. Um, Israel appears to be cutting the north off from the rest of Gaza. Uh, I mean, I just want to ask you whether this sounds to you like that so-called general's plan that was put forward uh, by some retired Israeli generals with a view to starving out Hamas uh, leaders from the north of the enclave. Does it sound to you like that plan is now in action? Well, I don't think I'm in a position to speculate on, on the military strategy that's being deployed. What I can uh, comment on uh, is the access, humanitarian access, both in terms of uh, the ability of the civilian population to access our assistance as well as the access of our or our ability to bring in humanitarian commodities into Gaza. And this is where we are facing severe constraints uh, over the past weeks. Uh, well, I could extend that to over the past months uh, where, uh, where, where this has become extremely difficult. Uh, and just to be clear, if food is being used as a weapon of war, people are being given the choice to move and potentially be safe, but no guarantees there, or stay and not be safe. I mean, that sounds as well like a forcible uh, transfer. Both of those things, using food as a weapon of war and forcible transfers, are illegal under international law, aren't they? That, uh, that certainly is the case. Uh, but again, I can't speculate on the intentions of those who are making those decisions. What I can uh, confirm is that access to humanitarian assistance has fallen precipitously uh, to the point where the acute rates of food insecurity, which were already at crisis or worse levels across the population, are being further exacerbated to what essentially is the, uh, the, the, the limiting point. Uh, we speak in humanitarian language of a catastrophic food insecurity. Uh, if things don't change significantly over the coming period, that is precisely where we'll end up. Yeah, and people who are told to leave northern Gaza and told to go somewhere else, I mean, that begs the question, doesn't it? Where can they go? Is there anywhere safe? And do you think no. people are, are reluctant to leave the north of Gaza? Because they've had lots of guarantees of safety in the past, but their trust in those guarantees has been severely undermined, I'd imagine, uh, during these last 12 months. I think that's fair to say. And, and I think, objectively speaking, uh, we can't speak of any s real safe areas across the Gaza Strip. Even the area that's been designated as the humanitarian zone is subject to forced evacuations, forced displacements, uh, as well as military incursions. So uh, that certainly would be a legitimate uh, concern. I think one can also imagine that people in the northern Gaza simply uh, don't have an, a, an accurate picture of, of what is going on and, and would be reluctant to give up what they know or what they have for uh, the proverbial unknown. So, yeah, it, it, I can imagine that's a very difficult decision. Uh, from a humanitarian perspective, our solution is very simple. We need to be able to get humanitarian commodities in. Uh, we need access to those populations in a safe and secure way. And ultimately, uh, would even go further to advocate for a ceasefire as the uh, the only meaningful solution from a humanitarian perspective. Um, I'd just like to ask you how quickly the situation, the humanitarian disaster in, in Gaza is unfolding, especially in the north, uh, because a survey was done last week uh, by a medical organization. They said that 10 percent of children uh, in the north of Gaza are severely malnourished. That was last week. How long does it take to get from a situation like that where 10 percent of children are uh, malnourished to the point that uh, they're really at very high risk of famine. That can go very quickly. I mean, that, that, uh, those type of uh, deteriorations can, can take place over a period of 10 days to two weeks, uh, especially if the cutoff of access to food is, uh, is, is as acute as it could be. Uh, uh, I think the 10% the is a credible figure. It's very difficult to get accurate figures under the current circumstances where 
conventional approaches to carrying out uh, nutrition surveys are almost, if not actually, impossible. But uh, what we know is that we, you know, previously have gone through periods when the North, in particular, was under uh, heavy attack, where uh, rates of acute malnutrition, global acute malnutrition, were well over 15 to 20 percent, which is really uh, the emergency threshold, and, and our concern is that we are uh, going back to that situation once again. Bart, I just want to ask you about a report that was put out earlier this month by your organization, the IRC, and it really highlighted <clears throat> just how heartbreaking this conflict in Gaza has been for children and how children are really uh, bearing really a, a big portion of the brunt of the suffering there in Gaza. Tell us a bit about the findings of that report. Well, that, that report is trying to highlight uh, our, uh, the, the plight of children in general, uh, but, you know, in terms of uh, how they are bearing the brunt of the crisis, whether it be in terms of uh, acute malnutrition, whether it's in terms of almost total loss of access to education, and also specifically with regard to separation from their families, either because of uh, being di uh, uh, disconnected through, uh, through fleeing, uh, whether it is the death of their family members uh, and that sort of thing. It's really extraordinary and the numbers are significant. Uh, and equally important to bear in mind is the fact that a, let's say, a typical humanitarian response, which, which would be to try to transition almost as quickly as possible to a reunification process where these children could be reunited either with their, ideally with their parents uh, and if possible uh, with, with extended family, is almost, uh, is almost impossible under these conditions. So, yeah, it's, it's really, it really was a, a message to underscore how the children are, are really bearing the brunt of the crisis itself. Yeah, and what really struck me in that report as well is how even with the end of fighting, that is not the end of the crisis for these children. In fact, they may be paying the price for the rest of their lives. That could mean, mightn't it, uh, a whole generation really seriously scarred uh, mentally by... Uh, the effects of what's been happening there in Gaza. Absolutely, and, and not only mentally, there are also uh, permanent physical uh, uh, issues at stake where, uh, you know, this combination of chronic and acute malnutrition uh, can lead, to, in particular with very young children, to, to, to permanent physical issues. and. Uh, so yeah, this this really is is across the board. Uh, also, in terms of of, of uh, education and and the implications there, uh, it's all compounded to to ultimately uh, leaving them with a very heavy price to pay. I'd like to ask for your reaction to that news out of Washington. That ultimatum. Well, it sounded like an ultimatum from uh, the U.S. to Israel. If more aid doesn't get through to those badly affected parts of Gaza, then the U.S. will pull the plug on some military assistance to Israel. Um, what, do you, what do you make of that? And do you think it will make a difference? Again, I mean, these are political and military issues that uh, I'm not really well positioned to comment on in terms of, of, of the how and the why. What I can say uh, unequivocally is that we welcome any pressure on all of the parties to the conflict uh, to promote access to humanitarian aid. In this sense, uh, we welcome it. Uh, we welcome it also because it is a clear acknowledgement that the situation is unbearable uh, and that something needs to change. And just tell us, for the benefit of our, our viewers, what the activities of the International Rescue Committee are principally in uh, the occupied Palestinian territory and beyond, because I'm assuming you've got uh, uh, suddenly a, a lot of additional uh, pressure on your resources coming from other parts of the region, and I'm assuming uh, Lebanon. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think it's obvious that uh, 
humanitarian engagement in Lebanon will now have to be ramped up, scaled up. Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that we are in competition with each other because I think both crises are generating uh, resources that uh, we uh, are hoping to deploy. Uh, but uh, obviously that, that is a big challenge in the case of uh, the, the occupied Palestinian territories. We are running uh, multi-sectoral programming, including health, nutrition, water and sanitation, uh, a lot of uh, uh, child protection programming and early childhood development uh, initiatives that are integrated in such a way as to have maximum impact. Yeah, sure. So it, it, clearly a huge uh, amount of pressure on uh, limited resources. I mean, did the IRC and, and do organizations like yours have provisions to, to, to manage uh, the number of different crises that, that, that they're facing at the moment? I think the simple answer to that is the, the global resources available to respond to the global humanitarian crises is severely insufficient. I'm not aware of any uh, humanitarian appeal uh, that is fully funded. Uh, the degree of funding varies uh, across each crisis. Uh, typically, if we get 50% of what we estimate uh, should be an, uh, uh, an appropriate response, then we're very, very happy. Uh, to be frank, I'm not sure where we stand uh, on the appeal for, for the occupied Palestinian territories, but uh, uh, to say that uh, we, we don't have enough is, is, uh, is certainly an accurate statement. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed for taking uh, the time to speak to us. Bart Widevin uh, of the IRC, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, turning to Lebanon now, where at least 15 people have been killed in Israeli airstrikes on homes and a health care centre in Kana. That's a southern Lebanese village that's previously been affected by Israeli massacres in both 1996 and 2006. Well, at least five people were also killed when an Israeli airstrike hit a local government building in Nabatia in southern Lebanon. Well, officials say the town's mayor is amongst the dead. Well, earlier today, airstrikes also targeted the southern suburbs of Beirut just hours after the U.S. voiced its concerns over the scale of the attacks on the Lebanese capital. Well, these new strikes follow statements from the country's prime minister, who claims to have received assurances from the U.S. that Israel would halt its military operations. Meanwhile, the Israeli prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has rejected the idea of a unilateral ceasefire in Lebanon. In a call with the French president, Emmanuel Macron, Netanyahu said that a ceasefire wouldn't improve the security situation and would only restore things to how they were before. He also told Macron that Israel wouldn't agree to any deal that allows Hezbollah to rearm or regroup. Well, this comes after Emmanuel Macron pressed Israel to follow UN resolutions, including ending its occupation of Palestinian territories. For more, we can cross now to Washington and speak to U.S. diplomat Jeffrey Feltman, who's a former Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs. Um, thank you so much for joining us. You're also a former U.S. ambassador to Lebanon, former U.S. Consul General in Jerusalem, and you worked extensively with the U.N. and served both Democratic and Republican administrations. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Clearly, uh, from your credentials, lots we can ask you about. But I'd like to ask you about your experience in Lebanon, because you served uh, during the years 2004 to 2008, meaning you were the U.S. ambassador uh, right in the middle of the 34-day war between Israel and Hezbollah. And I just want to ask you, 20 years since that war, here we are, and I'm assuming you're feeling a depressing sense of uh, deja vu. Yeah, I, I didn't particularly want to see the sequel to the 2006 movie. That was bad enough. And watching the sequel is not very much fun. But there are, there are both similarities and differences between the, the war now and the war in 2006. Um, in both cases, basically Hezbollah dragged Lebanon into war without any reference to the Lebanese parliament, without any reference to the Lebanese people. It's, a, it's an example of, Le of Hezbollah taking Lebanon hostage, basically, basically to the war. So that's something that's quite similar. But what's, what's 
different. And what's striking this time is that we've all been bracing ourselves for this war ever since the Hamas massacre in Israel on October 7th and Hezbollah's decision to start firing into northern Israel a day later. Whereas in 2006, it almost seemed to come out of the blue. The the um, cross-border raid that Hezbollah um, launched in 2006 that, that triggered that war, there'd been, a, there'd been relative calm. Um, people living on both sides of the border um, in, in, in security and, and, and without fear before, before that July 2006 war started but with Hezbollah's cross-border raid. So, so there's been time, for, time to prepare emotionally, time to prepare shelters, things like that. But I think that the escalation over the past three weeks has been far more rapid and far deeper in terms of the Israelis, the Israeli strikes than people anticipate, even, even having watched this with trepidation for a year. Yeah, escalating even in the absence of, of leadership uh, at the helm of, of Hezbollah. Um, I'd just like to ask you about something you said following on from the death of Hassan Nasrallah. Uh, you described Hezbollah as being Iran's most successful export. Um, and I just want to ask you, leading from that comment, uh, just how seriously degraded uh, you think Hezbollah has been during the course of these last uh, three weeks or so? I mean, I, I, I will admit that I'm... The Hezbollah has been, has its military capabilities, its leadership circles have been have been seriously degraded far more than I would have anticipated being being the case. That the Israelis have, have shown great success in penetrating Hezbollah um, in terms of in terms of intelligence, in terms of of understanding understanding Hezbollah's um, movements, Hezbollah's locations. So that I, I think the military degradation has been quite significant. Um, but I think it, it, it is impossible for the Israelis to eliminate Hezbollah. Hezbollah is not only Iran's most successful export, as I, as I described it, um, less successful perhaps than I assumed when I made that, that statement, given the degradation, but it's also a political and ideological movement. It also has deep roots inside, inside Lebanon. M many Lebanese absolutely, for very good reason, loathe Hezbollah, the, the wars being a good example. But there are other Lebanese who identify with it, who feel that, they've, that it, it has given them a sense of dignity and worth. So I don't think the Israelis are going to be able to eliminate Hezbollah from the Lebanese political landscape. But I do think that they have seriously degraded their military capabilities. Isn't there a risk that Hezbollah actually emerges from this, whatever the end game is, stronger than it was before? Because at the moment, the people of Lebanon have the choice uh, between not supporting Hezbollah and appearing to sympathize with what Israel is doing or supporting Hezbollah. And it seems most people are doing the latter. Well, I worry about a couple of things right now. Um, when, I, when I look at the, at the Lebanese, internal Lebanese political situation, I remember very well in that 2006 war that you, that you raised at the beginning of this interview, how at the beginning of that war, how furious the Lebanese were, the, the, the vast majority of Lebanese were just absolutely fear, infuriated that Hezbollah had dragged them to war, that Hezbollah had provoked that war, triggered that war. You know, they, they were having a peaceful summer. There were the family, family and tourists were visiting from overseas. And then all of a sudden, they were at war. Um, but as the Israeli bombings continued, including in, including in non-Hezbollah, what, what the Lebanese would consider non-Hezbollah areas, Christian areas, Sunni areas, et cetera, Druze areas, the public opinion turned. Public opinion turned its fury away from its initial fury against Hezbollah and then fury against, against Israel. And that benefits Hezbollah when the fury of the Lebanese solidifies solely against Israel, that benefits Hezbollah. So I worry that Israel is going to overreach. Israel's invasion in 1982 created the conditions from which Hezbollah emerged. And so, and so I worry that, that basically you could have Hezbollah 2.0 emerging um, from from this, but the other thing, I, the other thing that concerns me, and you may have, I'm sure that that, that your network reported on Naim Qasim, the Deputy Secretary General of Hezbollah, probably Acting Secretary General since Nasrallah's death. He gave a speech yesterday where he he hinted at basically threatening the Lebanese who are against Hezbollah's um, hostage taking of the Lebanese of the Lebanese state. So one thing that one thing that concerns me is not that Hezbollah will immediately emerge stronger in terms of its military capacities to to attack Israel, but it will turn its its weaponry against other Lebanese 
to solidify its control of Lebanese state institutions. Hezbollah, if, 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 if past is prediction of, of Hezbollah's behavior after this war, they will be patiently trying to rebuild their capacity. But to rebuild their capacities, they're going to need to maintain the type of control of the Lebanese state that allowed them to uh, import weapons, technology, et cetera, um, defying um, the rule of law and public accountability of the, of the state. May 2008, Hezbollah turned its weapons against the Lebanese people, against the Lebanese state, when, when the state tried to impose the rule of law over Hezbollah institutions, telecommunications, customs, etc. I worry that the immediate aftermath of this war, Hezbollah will try to deepen its penetration of, of Lebanon in order over the long term to rebuild the deterrent capabilities that Iran wants Hezbollah to practice, but that has actually been less successful um, than I think has um, Iran's investment suggested. Is there any way to stop that uh, eventuality? I mean, what's Israel supposed to do in order to stop Hezbollah, therefore, emerging from all of this stronger, as you've just described? Um, should they be going after Iran in a more severe way than they have done up until this point? Uh, and, and really try to get to the source of Hezbollah's funding and, and ideology, as opposed to tackling uh, this proxy of Iran uh, on the ground in Lebanon, where they're so deeply entrenched? Look, Hezbollah has posed a deep threat to Israel. The idea of Israel going after Hezbollah is a concept I think we all understand. But Israel has to be careful not to overreach. Israel's Israel's reaction to the first Palestinian Intifada essentially created the conditions for Hamas. Israel's 1982 for invasion of, of Lebanon essentially created the conditions for, his, for, for, for Hezbollah. Um, you see a, a repeated effort by the Israelis to address a legitimate security threat, but they go too far. And so looking, for, looking to try to choke off the financing of Hezbollah, trying to prevent the, the weapons smuggling of Hezbollah, I, I think all of us are all for that. But to try, but if, if they turn Lebanon into something that looks like Gaza looks like today, you're just going to have, that's what's going to lead to a stronger Hezbollah because you're going to unite the Lebanese people in solidarity against Israel, and you're going to destroy any semblance of other institutions inside Lebanon. Now, the Lebanese themselves have a responsibility here. And another concern I have on top of the ones I already mentioned is Lebanese passivity. The, the Lebanese saying, woe is, woe is us. Um, we don't have any agency here. It's all the outside powers. It's Iran, it's Israel, it's, it's, it's everybody else. The Lebanese themselves have a responsibility to try to strengthen their own state institutions, to try to, to um, transcend that Lebanese passivity, that they have no agency, that they have no control. So I would look at a combination of things. How do you, how do you tighten the, the screws against Hezbollah's financing, Hezbollah, Hezbollah's arms smuggling? How do you inspire the Lebanese to start taking control of their, of their own state? Um, and, but, but you can, and then you look for some kind of diplomatic opening that could finally, finally enable the implementation of that resolution 1701 that ended the 2006 war. If you read that resolution 1701, the words are good. The goals are still applicable, but it was never fully implemented. It did, it, it, it led to the ceasefire in August 2006. In that, it was a success. The Israelis at the time wanted to withdraw. They needed um, something to point to to explain why they were withdrawing from southern Lebanon. But of course, the resolution um, failed to create that area free of, of armed personnel, weapons, and assets between the Latani River and the Blue Line. The, 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 the whose southern fault, whose of fault is that? Whose fault is that? That never happened. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a number of, of, of reasons why it was never implemented. Part of it is the Security Council itself. The Security Council never gave the UN force that's there, the UNIFIL force, um, that was that was greatly expanded after the 2006 war. They never gave them the authority to enforce the resolution. So UNIFIL had no ability to go after Hezbollah. Now UNIFIL could have done a better job reporting what they what was happening, 
um, but they did. They did, they were not given the tools by the Security Council to go after um, Hezbollah trying to to um, reembed itself in southern Lebanon. The other problem is again the Lebanese. The Lebanese armed forces were supposed to deploy in partnership with UNIFIL to fill the security vacuum, basically fill the space to make a, to at least complicate Hezbollah's abilities to um, to to rebuild its capacities capacities in the south. The, prime, the acting prime minister of Lebanon now, the caretaker prime minister, Najib Mikati, has said Lebanon is prepared to send the, the 11,000 Lebanese armed forces troops to the south. That's significant because since 2006, the Lebanese armed forces have also increased their capacities, and we've seen how they've been able to move against Sunni terrorists, jihadist terrorists um, in, in the Bekaa Valley and, and elsewhere. So there, the elements that, that didn't come together in 2006 might be able to come together now. But of course, the Israelis are going to be far more skeptical. The Israelis are going to need to have additional assurances, given the fact that for the last 18 years, since that 2006 war ended, Hezbollah has been implementing lessons learned, and the Israelis are going to be a, expect to see um, something new that would tell them, okay, fine, the objectives of 1701 now are being taken seriously by by the Lebanese, by the international by the international community. But a continued occupation of southern Lebanon is going to make the situation worse, not better. Okay, and, and I just want to pick up on something you were talking about there as well uh, early in your answer. You're talking about uh, Lebanese passivity, um, and obviously there is a serious void in the Lebanese political landscape. I'm just wondering, do you think it would be helpful, or can it be achieved? Uh, that Lebanon uh, manages to form a functioning government in these current circumstances? Or do you think that's something that with the country, uh, you know, essentially in a, in, a, in a state of war, that's something that simply cannot be put together and, and, and all the will in the world and, and Lebanon's allies would be simply unable to help Lebanon to achieve uh, that outcome? I mean, I mean, it's absolutely inexcusable that Lebanon doesn't have a functioning government now. Um, and the reason why it doesn't have a functioning government, has only a caretaker government, is because Hezbollah prevented the, elect, the election of a president for nearly two years, for nearly two years now. Hezbollah doesn't have the power to impose a president through parliamentary means. I suppose they could do it under the, you know, with, a gun, with guns, but they, but, they, but they do have sufficient weight in the Lebanese parliament to prevent a, power, a president from being, from being elected. Um, and there is a parliamentary block, a, a sort of a cross-sectarian opposition block that's been going around meeting with the prime minister, the, the, the acting prime minister, the speaker of the parliament, and others, the army chief, to try to start to put together um, the pieces of a plan of how you of how you rebuild a government um, in Lebanon. Obviously, it's obviously right now people are worried about um, their safety. They're they're worried about making sure their loved their loved ones are not are are having the the support that they need but that doesn't preclude people starting to come out and talk about how you rebuild a lebanese state not a lebanese state against the against the shia not a, not something that would provoke a sectarian war again the lebanese are quite sensitive to the idea of sectarian war um, having lived through that 15 year civil war but something that um allows the state to deliver the sorts of services that hezbollah has used to build loyalty among its among its cadres. Um, we're coming close to the end of, of this discussion, but I just want to ask you, of course, with the US election uh, less than three weeks away now, um, whether you think, and you know, a lot of people have told this channel, uh, a lot of US uh, officials have told this channel as well, that they feel that uh, US diplomacy has failed uh, to uh, avert uh, the, the situation we find ourselves in, not just in, in Lebanon, but also in, in, in Gaza and the West Bank. Whether you think all of this has done a, a, a major favor to uh, Donald Trump and to his chances of uh, winning re-election? I don't know how much um, this is actually going to affect the elections. Um, and the, the cliche in the United States is that foreign policy doesn't matter. I think that's an exaggeration. I think that in this case, foreign policy does matter. Um, th that the and and you can talk about it demographically the, the voting blocks in Michigan that um, are heavily Arab heavily heavily Muslim for example what does that mean what does that mean for a key for a key battleground state 
for, for, Kamala, for Kamala Harris. Um, but I don't think that the, that, the, that the Biden administration's foreign policy um, direction on this war has derived from, from electoral calculations. I think it's derived very much from the president's own sense of solidarity with, with Israel that, that comes from when he first visited Israel and Golda Meir was prime minister. He talks about it all the time. I think that, that the president has truly set the direction of the foreign policy in the Middle East. And I and I don't think it's been I don't think it's been 100 percent successful. Believe me, I think that the um, that the Israelis have shown time and time again that they will perhaps nod politely, maybe not 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 so politely, but then go off on their own way, whatever the concerns are of the of the Biden administration. And while while the Biden administration, I think, has successfully shown that it can help Israel um, counter. Iranian attacks, we saw that both in April and, and in October, the major objective of the Biden administration of preventing an all-out regional war, there's still a question mark, whether that's, whether that's going to happen or not. I mean, when you look in, and think that there's, that there's been fighting in Iraq, that there's been, that there's been missiles from the Houthis to Israel, that you've got, you've got Lebanon plus, plus the West Bank, not, not to mention Gaza, can we even say that he succeed, that, that the Biden administration succeeded in preventing a regional war? It looks pretty region wide to me at this point, even if it's not yet all out. And let's hope it doesn't become all out. OK, well, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to speak to us. Really appreciate it. Jeffrey Feltman, thank you. Thank you. Well, that is all we have time for, for Global News Today. Thank you for watching. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for more exclusive interviews. Until then, goodbye.